Welcome. My name is Alberto Garcia and I'm going to give you some ideas about the pseudo-potential concept. This is based on work by many people over many years. Let's start with this simple experiment. Imagine that you are able to plot the radial profile of the charge density of the silicon atom and you do that for the core and the valence part separately. The valence in this case is the 3s and 3p orbitals, marked here in red and corresponding to this spread out valence charge. Now imagine that you take one electron from the valence complex. Obviously the charge density of the valence part is diminished, but the, the core part stays basically the same. And a similar thing happens when you take up to two, two more electrons. Even if you take out three electrons from the atom, which is a very dramatic change to the valence charge density, the core charge is almost unchanged. So the resolution of the screen is the same as before. Now, this is a very dramatic change in the valence, and when you consider chemical bonding, the changes brought about by chemical bonding are much, much smaller than this. So if the core electrons don't notice the big change in uh, 3 plus ionization, they are not going to notice the changes happening when the atom gets bonded to the neighbors. Summarizing this idea, we can say that internal electrons are inert and do not participate in the chemical bond. So this is the idea of the pseudopotential in a nutshell. We're going to ask the question, if the core electrons are inert, why don't we get rid of them and focus only on the valence electrons and try to ask what is the effective potential for the valence electrons when we abstract out the core electrons? There's going to be some kind of black box, rather a green sphere here in the core region, and the electrons are going to feel some kind of effective potential, which, as we will see, looks like this in the, in the more modern formulations, but it's just an effective potential. Now, the formalism for the pseudo-potential mature when Phillips and Kleiman proposed their cancellation theorem. It was based on ideas by Herring, in particular his orthogonalized plane wave method, which embodies already the basic feature of the electronic states of valence electrons in the solid. They need to be orthogonal to core electrons. So, even if you think that your valence electron is going to be represented by some kind of soft wave function, when it gets to the nuclear region, it's going to be orthogonal to the core states, and so you need some kind of wave function that, needs, that takes that into account. You add this term to the soft part that orthogonalizes the wave function to the core states. Now, when you take this trial wave function in the Schrodinger equation, you end up with an effective equation for the soft part, which has this repulsive operator. It's repulsive because this is a positive term, because the energies of the wave functions for the valence part are higher than the eigenfunctions, eigenvalues of the, the core states. So this is a repulsive potential when you add it to the attractive Coulomb potential, you get a, not, not a complete, obviously, but a, a partial cancellation, and the resulting effective potential is soft. Now, this formalism is elegant, but from the practical point of view, it was really hard to implement as, as it as is in, in those days. People just kept the main idea that the pseudo potential is something softer in the code. So, we're going to work with that idea from now on and see how it plays out. The first thing to notice is that for most systems, you're going to have a lot of savings just by forgetting about the core electrons. In particular, for sodium, out of the 11 electrons in the atom, you can forget about 10. And you describe this valence electron, the 3s, as flying through the crystal, 
feeling some kind of effective potential. What kind of effective potential? Well, you don't know in principle, but you can model it. Models for pseudopotentials date back already to Fermi and Hellman in 1934, and really took off in the early 60s with the application of very simple models that could be fitted to experimental properties. In those days, you could get some electronic structure data from experiments, things about Fermi surfaces and uh, optical experiments. And these simple model potentials, like the empty core pseudo potential of Ashcroft and similar models by Heine and Navarenko, all have a reduced set, in some cases just one parameter, in Heine and Navarenko's model, a few more, but they are of the basic form of uh, a core region where things are softer and then the Coulomb tail of the pseudo potential. Now, if I make do a digression, Imagine that you Fourier transform these simple models and you get something like this, which you need to screen with a simple Thomas Fermi model in the, in the solid, and you get something like this. Now, um, this is uh, the result of a model. But imagine now that you are in a periodic solid and you include the structure factor. Or that is the Fourier transform of the positions of the atoms, basically. For a typical structure in a solid, this thing is different from zero only for relatively few g vectors. And in the range in which your pseudo-potential Fourier transform is not zero, only a few of these wave function, I mean, sorry, wave vector modules are relevant. In this case, just these three. You can get away with just using these three points to parameterize the full self-consistent effective potential in the solid, something that goes into this Schrodinger equation here. You can fit these three numbers to experimental information, and you have the empirical pseudo-potential method that Marvin Cohen and co-workers developed in the early 60s. This was extremely successful because it allowed you to get some relatively limited experimental information, plug it into your theory through those three parameters, and then get the whole band structure of mostly semiconductors in those days. This was a huge step forward. We come now to the modern era of pseudopotentials. In this modern period, we have density functional theory, which we like to see as a very sophisticated model of the interactions of electrons in real materials. But in particular, DFT can also be applied to atoms. In this case, the external potential feature in the theory is just the Coulomb potential of the nucleus. And solving the consum equations, we can get the orbitals of the all-electron problem. Such an orbital is pictured here. This is a valence orbital, the silicon 3s, and we already, we expected it to be orthogonal to the core state, so we have a wave function with two nodes. Now the reasoning goes like this. If core electrons are inert and we want to get rid of them, and if the nodes are a signature of the core electrons, why don't we get rid of the nodes. Why don't we iron out the wave function and get rid of the nodes, such as here? The idea is to get this pseudo wave function by picking some point at which you want to match it to the real wave function. The matching procedure here involves continuity of obviously the value and a few derivatives, depending on the method. And also a very important second condition is that the norm of the two-way function and the pseudo-way function should be the same. Now, this is important from the point of view of electrostatics, so that the, the long-range effect of the charge is the same. But also because, and this is a result of scattering theory, the change with energy of the scattering properties 
is related to the norm. So, if the norm is the same, the change, not just the value of the scattering property at the point at which we are fitting, but also its derivative with respect to energy is the same. This is important because what you want when you generate the pseudo potential is transferability to other settings. You have generated the pseudo potential in an isolated atom, but it should be transferable, for example, to a solid in which you don't have sharp atomic eigenvalues, but you have bands. So something you fitted perfectly to an atomic eigenvalue and an atomic wave function now needs to work for a range of energies around that. This split is around that, more or less, around that eigenvalue. So if you are guaranteed that the, both the scattering properties at this energy and its energy derivative are the same, you can trust some level of transferability of your pseudopotential. Now, to conclude the process, we need to find which potential, which effective potential <coughs> acting on the pseudo wave function gives the same eigenvalue. Now, to conclude the procedure, we need to find the pseudo potential itself. And the way is to compare this equation, which gives the actual wave function, the all-electron wave function, using the all-electron potential, compare it to this other equation, which we have here the pseudo-wave function, and here we have the screen pseudo-potential. If we invert this equation, we get the screen pseudo-potential like this, and all that's left to be done is to unscreen the pseudo-potential, by taking out the hard tree screening and the exchange and correlation screening in this case also. Here n is the valence charge density. There are some minor complications with this because this term is non-linear in the charge density and in some cases you need to take into account some model for the core charts to do the unscreening correctly, particularly for magnetic systems. Um, this is the subject of nonlinear core corrections. So in the end, what we get out of this procedure is what is called an ab initio pseudopotential. Its main features are that first, when you get away from the core region, it should uh, go into the, the Coulomb part, the Coulomb form. Also, another interesting feature is that the procedure you, we have uh, followed for the 3s orbital can be done for other orbitals with different angular momenta. So in general, you get different radial parts for different angular momenta, in this case, S, P, and D. Formally, this means that the pseudopotential we have found is a semi-local operator in which first you have some projector to find the angular momentum of the electron, and then you need to multiply that part by the appropriately generated radial part, dl of r. Now, this is not a very convenient form to work with. You can make it slightly better by taking some kind of common part of the, all the channels and calling it a, a local part, in which you don't have any projectors, and then dumping the rest, the short range remnants, into this non local part, actually semi local part. But dealing with this is still complicated from the computational point of view. And there is a better way, the Kleinman by Dander form, in which you do a transformation to get the fully non local operator. These are the basic uh, characteristics of the initial pseudo potential. In recent years, there have been many developments to address the transferability and cost issues but there is not we don't have the time here nor if the scope this is the scope of this talk to cover those i just list a few there were refinements in the node ironing and inversion procedures a new concept of ultra soft pseudo potentials in which you do away with the norm conservation condition at the expense of, of some other complications and also some normal conserving schemes with multiple projectors. All these refinements make the pseudo-potential field a bit threatening to newcomers, 
because they, they think that they need to invest a lot of time in finding out what the best method is and do a proper construction of the pseudopotential. That's very illustrative and is a good learning experience, but the good news is that in recent years, databases of curated pseudopotentials have come online. And behind these databases are people who have done a very careful work of generating and testing the pseudopotentials. So this is very good news, but still, you need to think that uh, the pseudopotential is still an approximation, and you need to test the pseudopotential, no matter how sophisticated the database is or the procedures to generate. If you want to find out more about this, I suggest that you start with a manual of your favorite simulation code and see how it uses pseudopotentials. By following the lead, you can learn a lot. It will take you probably to the relevant literature. You can also become familiar with available databases of pseudopotentials, but remember that you need to test it in your appropriate system to, to check that it's really transferable. Thank you very much.